much for uh, being here for our uh, blockchain panel. Uh, really appreciate you guys sticking around. Uh, I think we have a tremendous panel and panelists today. Uh, as part of the introduction, my name is Jason Kaplan. Uh, I'm the general counsel and director of policy at Blockchain for Change. We're a social impact fintech startup uh, leveraging blockchain technology to enable greater financial inclusion for low-income and homeless individuals. We created the Fumi uh, app, which is a marketplace where low-income users can transact with their service providers, like food pantries, homeless shelters, uh, and utilities, to digitize those transactions and enable uh, those data points to be used as credit score-worthy uh, uh, data for uh, greater financial inclusion. So thank you. And I have a tremendous panel here that I'd like to introduce to each one of, one of them here. Um, to my left is, is, is Hurley, Hillary Garlow. She is the Legislative Director and Counsel for Colorado Representative Jared Polis and is the co-chair of the Blockchain Congressional Caucus. Um, to her direct left is James Cross. He is the Director uh, of Strategy at Workday, where he explores the future of business work and technology to help guide the company's strategic direction. Um, then we have Mercina Tillman Dick. She is the Chief Operating Officer at the Global Blockchain Business Council and engages governments to further, for further adoption of blockchain technology and educating senior executives on how best to harness this groundbreaking tool within their organizations. And last but certainly not least uh, is Justin Herman, uh, who leads the Emerging, Emerging Citizen Technology Program Office for GSA, uh, engages with over 328 federal agencies uh, on, on issues from uh, artificial intelligence to blockchain, virtual and augmented reality and social tech. Uh, and I please give him a, a welcome round of applause uh, before we get started. So, you know, the first time many of us have heard of blockchain uh, really is in its association being synonymous with Bitcoin. Uh, and the price, as the price of Bitcoin went up to close to $20,000, my mom, when she asked about what I do, she asked me about why am I doing this Bitcoin stuff. I was like, my mom, mom, this has, what I do on blockchain literally has no affiliation with Bitcoin whatsoever. Um, and that's why it's obviously important that you're all here today to learn more about it. Um, but certainly beyond just cryptocurrencies, the application of distributed ledgers uh, technology uh, will go far beyond uh, to transform now well entrenched industries like banking, real estate, you know, manufacturing and human resources, and how they manage their data and verify transactions across many stakeholders. Uh, we're still in the very, very early days, even though it's 10 years old, still in the early days of blockchain industry. And uh, what we want to make sure is that this, the critical innovations that, uh, are, that are part of the blockchain technology are fostered and, and allowed to be dynamic and evolve, uh, and that public and private stakeholders can work together uh, to foster this growth, keeping in mind the, the concerns and risks around protection and security of data and identity of users. Now, with that, uh, I would love for uh, our panelists to James and Mercina in particular to kind of answer a fundamental question, a foundational question, that being, what is blockchain? Uh, and, and how does it relate to cryptocurrencies and differentiate from cryptocurrencies? Sure, so blockchain technologies were originally conceived and developed to support the needs of cryptocurrency. And people have been trying to create a viable cryptocurrency for quite some time, since the 80s and 90s, through what we call the cypherpunk movement. And lots of the underlying technologies are based around cryptography when it comes to blockchain and Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin itself was um, developed by a mysterious figure called Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who he is or she is. Um, and since then, that was really the first viable cryptocurrency. It brought together the right technologies and the right ideas in the right way to create Bitcoin, which as we know has been in the press quite a lot recently. So the best way to think about the difference between Bitcoin and blockchain is that Bitcoin is just really the, the first killer application of blockchain technology. Um, and it just happens that kind of um, a good way to keep this distinction in mind is to think that Bitcoin needs blockchain, but blockchain doesn't need Bitcoin. If you think of it that way, it kind of makes it a little bit clearer. Um, but it also just so happens that the things that make blockchain really good for under pa for powering a digital currency also make it really good for solving lots of real-world problems as well. Um, and that's why it's uh, really exciting to be here today. And in terms of how the technology itself works, um, well, it's really just a chain of blocks. So that's quite descriptive. Um, lots of people submit transactions to a blockchain network, and each block contains a little chunk of transactions. And every one of those blocks has a unique fingerprint or hash relating to its contents. And every block that comes after it 
um, kind of references back the fingerprints of every block that's come before it. And so if any block is changed after the fact, then it becomes apparent because the kind of blocks, the, uh, the fingerprints and hashes don't add up later on. Um, so it, it's really, really early days right now. And I liken today to the early days of the internet. We have a good idea that it's a really important technology, that it's gonna change the world. And we have some ideas of initial use cases, just like email was an initial use case of the internet protocols that underpin the internet today. Um, but back then, if you think back to the mid and early 90s, we knew it was important, but we had really no clue that it was gonna change the world in the way that it has. We didn't know it was gonna lead to changes in the way we shop, changes in the way we um, get information about elections and voting. We didn't realize it was going to change how we uh, move around cities and even change the shape of cities as we look to autonomous vehicles. Um, so it's really exciting to be here today to Thanks. explore the potential. Um, but James, I, I, I appreciate the intro. I don't know, Marcina, if there's any additional technical color you wanna add to it. Well, I think you did an excellent job um, explaining the tech behind it. The only thing that I would add is that blockchain really promises data integrity. And with all of these hacks, these very high profile hacks that we see, it seems on a weekly basis, that's something that everyone is very excited about. And when I explain blockchain technology, I think you did an excellent job kind of going over the basic details. But when I talk about it with my mom, for example, blockchain is like a set of rail tracks. And in order to move something from me to you, we need those tracks. Bitcoin or any of the other tokens that we use on top of the tracks are like the cars. Um, so that's that's kind of how she understands it. So <laughs> See, I'm, I'm probably going to ask you to my house later so that you can explain that to my mom as well so that she can fully understand. Um, before we jump into a lot of the sort of use cases, I, you know, Hillary, I really want to learn about kind of where uh, Congressional Blockchain Caucus, uh, there's seemingly a lot of excitement around it. Uh, I heard that all of the seats on the caucus are already filled up and there's a waiting list to get on the caucus. Um, but, but really kind of what sparked the creation uh, from Congress to create the caucus and, and what do you see as some of the near-term goals uh, for you and, and, and the work that you're doing? Yeah, well there's not, I mean, there's not a limited number of seats. Anyone can, any member of Congress can join the caucus. So if you're going up to the Hill, you know, encourage them to join. Um, you know, Jared and, you know, I'm fortunate enough to work for a member who um, has a deep understanding of technology. Um, and Jared and Mr. Schweikert, um, you know, and Mr. Mulvaney, prior to Mr. Schweikert, um, decided, you know, there is a lot of interest around the use of blockchain technology. And of course, there's a lot of interest around cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin in particular. and but they thought that the more interesting issues were about blockchain technology and how that could be used to solve government problems and kind of trying to delink cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Obviously, there are some instances where they're very connected, um, but there are also, you know, potential government applications um, that or issues or programs that could utilize this type of technology and we could resolve some issues around identity management, for example, being you know, housed in multiple different agencies, allowing those different agencies to have access to um, that type of information. Um, you know, government program accountability would be another great way to use um, and verify transactions would be another great way to use um, blockchain technology. So that's kind of where um, the caucus kind of came, this idea of the caucus came out of. And a lot of it is around education. You know, we have, there are 435 members of Congress and they have all heard of Bitcoin in some capacity, whether it's in a positive way or a negative way, they all understand what Bitcoin is, at least have some under, basic understanding of it, but they don't under, necessarily understand the underlying technology. And that is really what the caucus aims to do, is to educate members and their staff in the event that something comes up or we want to move legislation to you know, in, improve um, agency investment in uh, new technology. Um, but in case there's something that comes up that, you know, has a huge impact on the financial markets, you know, we want members to understand what blockchain technology is um, going forward. So if we 
if in the event that Congress decides to legislate something, we understand what we're legislating. Great. Well, I thank, thank you for that. That's a real, uh, really important to, to know that, that the work is going on. And, and Justin, you know, I wanted to throw it to you because I know you, when we spoke, you were extraordinarily excited about all the work that you're doing, yet somehow no one knows about it, and you want to make sure people do know about it um, in your work with all the agencies that are interested in blockchain technology. Well, it's actually, um, it's a trend that we saw throughout today, and a lot of the federal managers and emerging technologies that are attending this conference, is that there's a number of people who assume it's not happening, and assume that federal agencies are not looking at things like artificial intelligence or blockchain, and so when things are happening, and especially when those programs are reaching out and asking for more partnerships and more co-development, people aren't even looking in that direction to even know those opportunities when they exist. So yes, uh, up here for blockchain, it's our pleasure to come here and talk because I'll tell you how we got involved um, in the blockchain community and also the initiative. Less than a year ago, there were so many federal agencies coming to the table demanding that more government-wide programs and knowledge networks and co-pilots programs came together in order to explore blockchain technology. People had already done analysis on what specific use cases that they thought they had and wanted to be able to invest it. But if you looked at the public dialogue and where that was on the US government, it basically was saying that the US government is not even thinking about this stuff at all. And it's a trend also, and I think that we talked about, is oftentimes if a government body isn't publicly, like, let's say, issuing guidance or issuing a regulation, people assume then that they're not thinking about it. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, on emerging technologies, especially blockchain and government, there are a few people who aren't talking about it one way or the other, either completely all for going forward, other people who are healthy skeptics, but either way, the dialogue, the programs, the ideas that are going to be shaping how we're going to move forward, and rest assured, inevitably, there will be forward movement on it, those things are happening right now. And the more that people recognize that and discuss it, the better we can make smart decisions and, on it. And just to that point, I mean, is there a specific use case that, that you are working on right now? I know you were talking about you're, you're fielding engagement from various agencies that are looking to you as a source to understand the technology, how it can best serve that agency. Is there any specific particular use case uh, uh, agency that you're working with that you can share to kind of just sort of color yeah. the, the application for which you're, you're speaking about? Like, like you mentioned, so we work with over 320 unique federal, state, and local uh, agencies on emerging tech, and a lot of that is blockchain. Uh, and so we can see, and it's not just on the federal level, it's throughout all layers of public service that there are people who, it's not like they're waiting to pilot it. They've already done successful pilots on it. I mean, this is, this is as real as it gets. But the, as Shakespeare said, the path to true love never did run smooth. And of course, it's like you've got on one side of the coin, people, oh geez, that was a pun. I, uh, uh, it's an afternoon, didn't mean the puns there. Uh, but you have one side where people are either complete evangelists for it, and this is going to change everything today. And then there's people who are like, well, why aren't we looking at pre-existing technologies um, that have been sitting there and maybe not being best used that we've got to blow the dust off on? And the answer to both both those questions or things is yes. Um, not only is it looking at the potential of what blockchain can be doing uh, and you know for acquisitions. We already have a GSA locally. We did a successful acquisitions pilot that greatly streamlined our processes aimed at getting small businesses being able to do business with government quicker. I mean, that's a pretty good case. But we hear identity management, supply chain management, truly the gambit of what the private sector is thinking about. I guarantee you that there are federal agencies that we we are working to help support and coordinate who are thinking and exploring the same things. And we should be thinking and exploring those things together, not in little silos, not in walled gardens, but having public discussion on it. Oh, that's great. And, I, and you hit a great segue in terms of the, the private applications of blockchain technology. And I really wanted to steer it to, back to James Mercina just to kind of learn about how Workday is, is looking at blockchain. Why have they dedicated resources to the technology and in what ways they leverage it? And then also hearing from Mercina just about your, your community of corporate uh, members and, and how they're thinking about the blockchain uh, in a way that will, will expand their business and improve it. James, if whoever, whomever, go for it. Okay, I'll start. Um, so we are seeing a number of really compelling projects, projects across the globe. And two that I'll highlight um, are pretty far 
in terms of their testing. So last year, the Republic of Georgia um, moved all of their land titles onto a blockchain-based system. And it's exciting because if you look at blockchain technology, it can't fix everything, regardless of what some people may tell you. Um, you need to make sure that the data that you're feeding into the system has a lot of integrity and that it's accurate, because once it's in there, it's an immutable record. And in the Republic of Georgia, the World Bank ranks their land registry as number three in terms of accuracy. So they were a really good test case. And after moving all of their records to a blockchain-based system, a process that used to take a matter of days or weeks now takes a matter of minutes. It used to cost a couple hundred dollars, and it now costs a fraction of a cent. And individuals who have land titles have this key, which they can access regardless of natural disasters or wars or whatever may happen. There's no centralized point of attack or failure. So that's a pretty exciting um, use case that we've seen in the last year. Another that I'll highlight is based out of Australia. There's a company called Power Ledger. And they put solar panels on top of apartment buildings. And then everyone has their own kind of source of energy. If they don't use the energy, though, they sell it back to the grid and they can trade it on a blockchain-based system. And I feel like that's a really good way to see kind of what blockchain can offer um, to a broad range of sectors. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, you you really spoke to it in terms of the optimization that can occur in these systems and these businesses where before there was difficulties of really kind of transacting in, in that same manner with blockchain technology, though it then becomes seamless. So, and James, uh, where, where do you see, where's Workday, um, you know, diving into in, in the blockchain world and how do you see that really optimizing your business? Sure, so Workday's HR and finance applications touch around 27 million employees across the world. And we serve some of the world's biggest companies, people like FedEx and Amazon and, um, and Unilever. And so we also run about 42 billion transactions in the cloud every year. That's everything from payrolls to job changes to financial accounting. And so any technology that um, might change the transactional side of the internet in the future is, of course, very interesting to us. And on our finance applications, we're also especially interested in things like smart contracts. Um, but some of the most interesting near-term use cases come from the HR side of the business. So right now, we're seeing some big changes in the labor market. We're seeing more people than ever before having multiple jobs, being gig workers, being self-employed, or being part-time employed. And we're also seeing people move in and out of organizations much more frequently. And there's currently a lot of friction as they do this. Um, if I apply for a job today, that employer is probably going to have to pay an outsourced background check company to call my previous employers, check I actually worked there when I said I did. Um, maybe call my university or get a university transcript to prove I have the education I said I did. And so that presents a perfect opportunity for technologies like blockchain because you've got multiple parties that need to contribute data. You need that data to be secure, to be controlled by the individual, and you also need the ability to verify that that data is true after the fact when it's shared with a third party like a potential employer. And so we see areas like this as a potentially um, really great real-world use case for blockchain technologies. And if we're able to achieve this, this is good for everybody. It essentially adds more liquidity to the labor market because we're reducing friction as people come in and out of organizations. And so there are lots of really exciting use cases. We recognize that um, really we have no idea how this technology is going to play out, but there are some really exciting near-term use cases that we're exploring right now. Great, thank you. I mean, it, it seems clear that there, there is no doubt this industry poised to revolutionize uh, uh, the way that we've been uh, operating our day-to-day -day business, uh, whether it's in, in contracts, uh, but also uh, in government and voting and identity. Uh, and, and I think that government plays a, a big role in the way that this industry can grow and, and foster, um, as well as also potentially uh, not foster, not, be, not grow, because there could be preemptive regulations or rules that, that may reduce the ability for startups like mine to uh, you know, innovate. So I guess what are, and this really is a question for all of my panelists, and I'd love for you all to chime in. You know, what do you see as both the work that you're doing in government uh, to foster uh, the growth of blockchain, uh, but what else, what else do you also see as some of the biggest barriers that, that government uh, and policymakers can put forth that could you know, really stifle, the, stifle that innovation? 
I, th I guess I'll start. Uh, there's two big things I think we could hit upon right now. It's how we approach the test evaluation of technology itself within the federal government. Uh, like somebody was asking before, we'd love to hear about some of the pilot programs you see in blockchain. And I said, well, the interesting thing is government's always had pilots. It's only now, you know, with AI and blockchain really become terribly interesting to people. <laughs> so it's not like they're hiding these things from you. It's just they're not used to you being so excited about it. Uh, and so I'll give you an example, and I, and I should have mentioned this before, I said ID, electronic health records. There is multiple government agencies right now exploring electronic health records through blockchain. But ultimately, I mean, we could already see the hurdles with it because if they're separate efforts, already we're adding barriers to it. We've got to design new and better ways to across agencies, across bureaucracies and silos to test, evaluate, and adopt these new technologies. It should be eight agencies that are all interested in electronic record management working together on one pilot, not eight separate pilots on a particular thing. That's going to require us to change our ways. That's why a lot of times we're looking at, it's called the shared services model. Mm -hmm. Because especially with like blockchain and AI, there is so much need and so little to look back on, whether real or perceived. It gives us a clean slate in many ways to do this and approach emerging tech for IT modernization the way it should be, unshackled and bound by the problems and inefficiencies of the past. Right. So to be able to create better government-wide pilots and to be able to do so partnered with industry and US businesses uh, is just really exciting. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'd like to follow up on that. I think yeah. something that we've seen a lot of is you know, various agencies have various pilots and people come and talk to us about the different programs are running. HHS had a hackathon on blockchain and the US Postal Service put out a paper or their IG put out a paper about the blockchain technology uses. State is doing something, DHS is doing something and everyone is kind of, it's to us, it seems very disparate um, that they're all working, um, CDC is working on something. I mean, it's like every, every agency almost. It's, it's it very exciting, but at the same time, you know, it is, for us, you know, I think we, um, you know, are kicking around the idea of trying to, you know, encourage the administration to start a commission around blockchain technology to bring together the different agencies to talk to one another so they can. You know, I think one of the issues that, uh, agencies still have to operate within the laws that their pro that govern their programs, and so around health identity, you know, they still have to take into consideration identity management laws that under you know underlie their you know various programs or you know, you know I mean I don't even know I'm not a health policy expert by any stretch of the imagination I'm barely a blockchain like policy person. Um, but, I, you know, it is interesting because some of the things that are coming up are some of the underlying programs, you know, some of the barriers to maybe better utilizing this technology might not necessarily be that the agency doesn't want to go forth and do it. It might be that they might need a tweak to how the underlying program is operating so it can, uh, so blockchain technology can be better utilized um, for, uh, for that agency. So that was actually the number two she was just <laughs> getting into. Uh, is the is technology, whatever, this stuff could be fixed. It's the culture. Yeah. Uh, and it's how we work together and everything. And I heard this multiple times throughout the day, the word zero sum game. So much in federal technology, and I'm sure in other places other than federal technology, is approaches as some zero sum game. Like if an agency is dedicating time to thinking and testing and evaluating emerging tech like blockchain, it means people will freak out like, no, but you're not paying attention to cloud now, or you're not paying attention yes. to this or to that. Mm -hmm. And what we need is more of this holistic look at the entire ecosystem. What is the role of cloud, of data services, of AI, of blockchain, and, and testing, evaluating the things that we don't know that's gonna come up in six months, but what are the roles that all of these plays as one integrated tech alignment uh, for public services? As long as we approach things as separate islands, that's like what we're trying to do, and that's what the, all the agencies getting as part of this group are trying to do, is break down those walls and have us look 
holistically of how thing all supports. Until we do that, even if something's a successful one-off pilot, what does it matter right. if the knowledge of that isn't shared? Well, and I, and I think you're speaking to this sort of change in culture, and, and I think it both applies to government, certainly, in terms of the bureaucracies and the cultures that are entrenched in the way that they've been operating. But I think in, in private practice and in, in, in private companies as well, when you have these large Fortune 500 companies, and they've done things a certain way for a very long time, sometimes it's difficult to steer that you know, that, that, that big ship to, to move towards blockchain or some innovative technology. I mean, are, you, are you seeing that even in the work that you're doing to pushing that innovation, you get that still having, you know, uh, some, some headwinds in doing that because it's not really the way that things have been done and trying to kind of fit that, you know, square peg in the round hole? Emerging tech like blockchain is not moving people's cheese, which is ultimately what people are afraid of in this space. It's melting the cheese completely. <laughs> it's making fondue out of the people's cheese. And that's why even if people like want to approach it like I'm interested, there's still that nervousness yeah. because we're talking about automation in many ways right. and we're supposed to not want to bring that up. But these are things we've got to talk right. about. And there's so many of these trigger words, as they say, around it that it makes it hard. But that's why we're up here. That's why we're talking. Well, I certainly hope that as one of the tweets is about fondue associated with our panel, because that would be perfect. It's and delicious. It, yeah, it's, it is delicious. <laughs> Mercina, Mer you want to talk a little maybe about sort of your corporate actors? About and the, fondue. About fondue. <laughs> about fondue, uh, your time in, in Davos you just came from. So maybe there was a lot of there fondue, was fondue uh, there. Was happening fondue there. 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 Yeah, so I just got back from the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland, and it's interesting because we launched as an organization officially a year ago during the annual WEF meeting. And when you compare kind of the energy surrounding blockchain in 2017 to the energy that we experienced last week, it's like night and day. And we were pretty chuffed that in 2017 there were about a dozen sessions dedicated to blockchain. But everywhere you turn, people were excited about this technology because I think over the next decade, it will fundamentally alter many of the systems that power everyday life. And a lot of corporations are very excited about it, but they do kind of want regulatory clarity. Mm -hmm. If they're moving forward and they're building this solutions, they want to make sure that they reach standards that are going to be accepted across the board. And so something that the GBBC really focuses on and it's similar to your work. I think all of the work that we're doing is very complementary, but we try to break down these traditionally siloed communities. We recently held a session in the European Parliament with a number of members of the European Parliament and the European Commission and innovators. And we got everyone up on stage together and we discussed these pain points because I think the biggest thing inhibiting progress at this point is a lack of information and education across the board. And of course, if you don't have accurate, actionable information, people are going to be anxious and it's going to impede progress. Absolutely, and I, and I think there are times where, you know, as a, as a private, uh, in the private sector, you take action, especially in a, in a nascent industry like blockchain, where there really isn't all of the sort of rules in place already and, and you're scared about taking that first step and either crossing a line that you didn't even know was there or taking that step and not seeing any line that wasn't a line, but then uh, weeks or months later, suddenly a line appears behind you and you look back and you're like, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so is there a sense of creating sandboxes for which private and public actors, and I think, you know, Justin, you've hit on it, but you know, Hillary would like to know if the conversations have gotten this far in Congress related to just you know, creating an environment, a safe space, if you will, for private and public actors can, can work together to you know, pr progress a lot of the innovation that's happening. I mean, I, you know, this sandbox idea has come up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, I, I'm not one to say Congress needs to step in to something when it doesn't need to. And, you know, I think, you know, passing laws to pass laws isn't a good way to legislate. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not entirely sure that we need to come up with some, Congress needs to legislate a sandbox. I think Congress can encourage it. I'm not even sure we could legislate a sandbox, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, but I think that there are ways that we can encourage agencies to come together. Uh, you know, I know the financial regulators do have pretty open discussions. I think this, it's pretty apparent with some of the conversations and things that have come out of the um, CFTC and SEC, and I'm not going to talk about what they've done. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I think, you know, 
you know, in terms of encouraging private-public partnerships, of course we want that, and of course we want government agencies to partner with the private sector if the private sector can help them. And of course, you know, we want to find a way to appropriately encourage that type of behavior. And you know, we are always willing to look at, you know, is there something, a pilot program we need to initiate, um, a pilot program across multiple agencies um, that we need to initiate um, to help to help encourage that. Um, but you know, it's in, the idea of a sandbox is interesting in the United States, where it's been used in other places. Because the U.S., we also, when you're talking about the federal government having a sandbox, it, that's one thing. But in other countries that have done sandboxes, they don't necessarily have states that we have. We have state laws that govern titling of property. You know, each state has their own statute related to, to property titling. One could be a race state, one could be like a race title. I mean, it's crazy. And so how do we, we can't, the federal government can't say to the states, you need to take one title titling statute and that has to be it. But how can we encourage it across the federal government? You know, that's a conversation that we continue to have and are willing to have. And I, you know, if someone comes up with a great way to legislate the sandbox, by all means, send it to myself or Tiffany, who's here, <laughs> Mr. Schweikert. But, you know, I haven't necessarily seen um, the, I, I, ha I haven't necessarily seen something that says we need to legislate this, but what are the ways that we can encourage it? Yeah, those are, those are really good points. Yeah, James? Yeah, so Workday comes to the table as a large software company that's innovating with blockchain. And also through Workday Ventures, I see a lot of uh, blockchain startups that are doing interesting things too. And so we're seeing a thousand flowers blooming out there in the kind of private sector world today. Um, and it's important that we don't kind of um, kill those flowers prematurely by over legislating so early on in the game. Um, and I think legislators and policymakers need to keep in mind the distinction between Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrencies and make sure that um, policy we put in place to regulate cryptocurrencies don't have a knock-on effect of actually hampering innovation with um, experimenting with the underlying technology, which has a lot of really good use cases in the world. Um, so that's really one important thing. And also, I think it's important that we put policies in place that give businesses trust in blockchain and, and kind of give them um, the confidence that they need to innovate with it. And so one thing that we believe is that um, we need to legally recognize information stored on blockchains. And we saw this happen in the early days of the internet. Um, two decades ago, Congress enacted the eSign Act, which was a landmark act which uh, recognized e-signatures on the internet. And we think a really good way to start legislating and uh, putting policy in place around blockchain would be to amend the eSign Act, um, recognizing um, information stored on the blockchain. And this would give businesses the confidence they needed to do further innovation internally and externally. So interesting. Uh policy position, and I think certainly one that could be considered. You know, we talk about blockchain and, 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 its, and its use cases around uh, the data that's being transmitted through the blockchain, and although that data is encrypted, certainly there are personal identifying information, there's various transactions happening, real estate transactions, et cetera. And, you know, we live in this post-Equifax world where the hacks of, of uh, information and centralized uh, uh, depositories exist. And we're moving now, obviously, to a distributed area where the where blockchain enables uh, that if you were to have a hack theoretically of a blockchain system, well, you would have to hack the thousands of computers that represent all the nodes within that decentralized or distributed uh, ledger um, to to try to effectuate that hack. But nevertheless, we still are seeing that uh, hacks occurring, certainly more on the cryptocurrency side of things, because there's just so much value in dollars at stake. Um, but there could potentially be risks around just attempted hacks for other valuable information like personal ID, uh, uh, property information, et cetera. Uh, have you guys thought in, in the work that you're doing around how to really protect that data to ensure that there is security there um, for, for the information that, that you are leveraging on the blockchain? Yeah, so we, we think a lot about trust. And Workday really is a trust company. Our customers trust us with some of the most sensitive data you can imagine, like social security numbers and health insurance details. And we're able to do that today because we have a centralized architecture that we control. Um, blockchain is also built around trust, but it's decentralized trust in a trust environment. Um, and so we think about, we think the enterprise applications of the future are going to span both centralized and decentralized architectures to do things that haven't been possible before, like the example before with labor markets and, and work resumes. 
Um, and we're also looking at hybrid blockchain technologies too, which incorporate private blockchains, which are permissioned and secured and shared with trusted partners, um, which periodically write a digital fingerprint to the public blockchain, allowing information that's chosen to be shared by an individual to be um, verified as being true as well. And I think finally, you really need to, like blockchain's really, really complicated, um, and you need to abstract a lot of that and just make it simple for the end user. And you see the same happening when you log into your internet banking today, you see the little green padlock, and you don't know what's happening behind the scenes, but you know that means you're secure. And um, we need to get to, the, to a similar state with blockchain, where there are little symbols and identifiers, and we've abstracted the technology enough that users actually trust it as well. Great. Justin? <laughs> I was just taking it in. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, part of it is like even the, the cycles in which we talk and introduce new ideas of, of things. It's like, so right now enough agencies are starting to come to the table specifically for us to start moving into quantum computing research. Mm -hmm. And that's something that a lot of times people are looking at as like five or 10 years down the road. But these conversations and this investment in it is already happening. Uh, and so when we talk about like the security, one of the things that he brought up, and I'm, I'm going to mention that my, my patron saint of blockchain technology, Andrew Van Johnny at GSA, uh, who's really a thought leader in, in, in the tech space, is there's a fierce debate that's ongoing about hybrid uh, approaches to it. And what then becomes, when is it just no longer blockchain, and it's really just somebody selling something to the government that's taking advantage of the word blockchain, mm -hmm. but doing something that ultimately is going to lock us out of the eventual benefits versus I, I try to take a very pragmatic approach where I don't actually care the technology behind the solution as long as government is being able to tackle solutions that seemed out of reach for it before. So if at the end of the day somebody comes and like we had a great workshop on blockchain and discovered that you actually using our existing technology in new ways, we can do X, Y, and Z better while we wait and we test for eventually then getting into it, right. that's also a win for us right. because ultimately it's agencies doing more with less and dedicating this to IT modernization. Yeah, and I think you hit on it that it's not necessarily a replacement of government, the re replacement of government activity, it's enhancing that government activity and enhancing the services that are already being provided by the government agencies. Yeah. I think that's a great point though about using, making sure if you're gonna use blockchain technology that it's, I mean this, this issue of open versus or public versus, you know, permission-based is also one that we often have on the Hill and in our office. And also we don't want the government to just be taken advantage of by a company that says we're using blockchain technology when really it's just database sharing. That like, would could never you, happen. Could you, have a, could you have achieved that through a, I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but a Google Drive, you know? Like, and so for us, it's really important that when, you know, when we talk about blockchain technology, we're not, we haven't gotten to the point where we are ready to define it yet. Yeah. And I think that will be if Congress and the government do start to define what is blockchain technology, I think then that will drive what agencies will consider to use, maybe. Yeah. That's why we're putting a lot of effort into this quarter and this year in particular in developing new training, education, and awareness programs around emerging technologies like blockchain. We're in the midst of launching it and specifically to not just target bringing those technologies and understanding within to government because let's be honest, we're going to be working a lot with U.S. businesses on this because those skill sets aren't in it right now, but also awareness for senior leaders who are non-technical, for legal and contracting specialists. It's not enough just to have somebody in your office who's smart on blockchain and they invest in crypto kitties and all of a sudden you've got it covered. <laughs> it's is a holistic thing. People have to figure out who the stakeholders are and ultimately we all are. And so for us, like the ultimate goal isn't, well great, 50 agencies are doing pilots on blockchain. No, but if we can show people are smarter and it, nothing else being able to know when to say no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate because it's not all about government agencies investing in every emerging tech. Mm -hmm. It's us being smarter shoppers, smarter partners, uh, and contributors. And that's the ultimate state the federal government should be in. Yeah, and you, you, you know, it, there is a sense like there's a sort of a, a gold rush kind of mentality in the way that blockchain is being used as the signifier of prosperity and, and, and something that is, is amazing for the entity that, it, that is, is saying it when in reality, 
it could not be. It, it may not be the applicable technology that, that's, that's best served for that, that private sector entity or public sector entity. Um, and you know, even the SEC has kind of called out those companies that have changed their name uh, to, to have blockchain included in it that have resulted in, obviously, uh, large, large jumps in their share price. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think you really got a, a really great handle on the way that you know our, our government is kind of looking at it, and I, I think you know Hillary and Justin, you got to hit hit on it perfectly, and it's been really fantastic learning about the work that you guys are doing. I know, Marcina, you you have in your organization take a global uh, uh, you know uh, perspective, and in terms of lessons learned or what other governments across the globe are doing things in blockchain that maybe we can learn from, that we can look to as examples, and to leverage that knowledge. What what would be some examples that you think we should be thinking about? It's a great question, and I mean, we're doing a lot of really good work in the United States, but there are a lot of economies that are actually much further along. I think in part because they're smaller, and so they're a little bit more agile, and they are embracing this technology full-heartedly. Um, just to your point quickly, uh, I think blockchain is not a silver bullet. Um, but as it's able to get people to re-examine these norms, which we've accepted as adequate, mm -hmm. it will accomplish, I mean, the goal is really to create systems that are more efficient and more secure and that work for everyone. Um, it's not to move everything to the blockchain because blockchains aren't actually applicable to every use case. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look globally, I would say it's really interesting in Dubai, they are moving all of their governmental records to blockchains by the year 2020. They've been extremely forward-leaning. In um, Japan, they have recognized Bitcoin as legal tender, which is a huge move. This was just last summer, and it means that now that cryptocurrency is tied to one of the strongest currencies in the world. Um, so that's very exciting. And then you look at places like Sweden, which are moving all of their land titles also to the blockchain. So there are some use cases that you're seeing over and over again, like land titles, like government records, where it does seem to make a lot of sense to create kind of this immutable, highly secure record. Fantastic. Well, listen, I, I, I think we've run out of time, although I think there might be time for a few questions, two questions. Um, so one, thank you, panelists. I really appreciate it. It was tremendous and fascinating dialogue we've had. Um, anyone have a question that, Okay, I got two right here, so we'll start with you, sir. And I, there's, a, there's a, a microphone coming your way. Coming back to the risk and safety question, specifically on Bitcoin, there have been problems with people losing their keys, losing their access to their wallet, and losing their Bitcoin. Yeah. And there have been problems with uh, Bitcoin piggy banks or custodians or repositories, I forget what they're called, being hacked and gazillions of dollars, gazillions of bitcoins being stolen. When when you have businesses, government agencies, and especially something like land records, what happens if somebody loses the key to their land record? Have they suddenly lost the title to, to their property? Uh, are people expected to download their keys to a thumb drive or uh, print them out and put them in a safety deposit box or put them on a post-it on their monitor like we've been doing for years. Well, um, it, it just seems that just like passwords yeah, have been it become a horrible security yeah. problem now, uh, it seems that the keys to managing all of the data that's being put in the blockchain are another source of problems and vulnerabilities and maybe catastrophes. Uh, I, I think uh, we hear a lot of this. I think it's called, and forgive me if I'm wrong, the paradox of the present where people will judge uh, the potential of something that's in development only by the conditions of today. So I'm not up here talking about Bitcoin. I never talk about Bitcoin. I talk about the underlying tech. But sometimes we'll be in an agency and somebody will talk about a problem. Well, we shouldn't be looking at this because X, Y, and Z. And it's something that's a term and condition of Bitcoin today or even a year ago. And yeah, you know what? I've read about that too. Really sucks when people lose their key and they lost their gabillion bitcoins, but that's not a condition of what we're talking about with you know blockchain being repurposed. And if it was a problem, the community come together and develop solutions around it. It's like saying, oh, look back to the beginning of the internet. How could we talk about having all these great new AI programs when my modem only works at this speed? 
well, we don't have modems anymore. And there's a lot of terms and conditions that change in that environment. And I, we, we're, Well, I, and I, I don't, I can't speak because I don't think anyone, we're not, no, no one yeah. here is obviously a, a county executive in, in managing land records, so I don't want to dive too deeply. I do lose my wallet and keys physically all the time, <laughs> so, though, so I'm kind of an expert and, on and it. We, I'm sure we can get you that answer, and I just one, one more question we had, and we, we'll be brief. Um, we'll try to be brief, at least. Huh? Yeah. I would say the easiest way to overcome it is. Oh. oh, sorry, there's Mike that didn't. Um, it was it was um, a, around the same issue of about control access. If you lose access to your token, you know what does that mean for the end user? Is that can, is that a good summary? Right. I, yeah. So I am not a technology expert by any stretch of the imagination, and I do think that this is a really good policy question. I don't think that we, as policymaker, and I'm only speaking for myself, not for Jared, not for the Congressional uh, Blockchain Caucus, but have thought. Uh, you know, I think that is something that we need to think more deeply about. Um, but I think we are confident in, you know, the people who are working on this type of technology to help us resolve those questions. You know, we aren't going to be, you know, find a member of Congress that will tie Bitcoin to the to the dollar. They'll never do it. I mean, I mean, I never say never, but I highly doubt it. And by maybe what Japan did is they've guaranteed that money. I don't know. They, you know. The U.S. dollar is not the U.S. government is not going to create another currency. Um, and I would just say that we are still in the very, very early days of this technology, and we are responding to all of those different threats and concerns. And you hear a lot more about issues when things go wrong. But if you look at Estonia, for example, they have digital identity and it works remarkably well. You can get an e-prescription, you can vote on your phone, and we don't hear enough about the places where things are going really right. I would love to vote on my well, phone. On that, I think we all would. And we're seeing on that, I think that's a perfect way of ending it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, and you can always find us and meet with us, ask us all the questions you want later, so thank you. That was fun, yeah.